here we are. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to this special interview time with a special interview guest. I'm Margaret Pinard, a historical fiction and fantasy writer here for today, A Mighty Blaze. So we're going to be interviewing Natasha Pulley, my lovely guest here. And um, I'm going to be streaming to multiple places. So wherever you are, you're very welcome. Make yourself at home. And we're going to dive into this lovely exploration of The Mars House, Natasha's newest book that comes out in six days on March 19th. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yes. Something like that. Yes. So very excited. Um, let me give you the lowdown on Natasha, her bio from the website. Natasha Pulley is the author of really quite a lot of books. An international bestseller, The Watchmaker of Filigree Street, won a Betty Trask Award and was shortlisted for the Authors Club Best First Novel Award, The Locus Awards, and remained on the Sunday Times bestseller list for much of summer 2016. The Bedlam Stacks, which if you follow my channel, you'll know I'm a huge fan of, was long listed for the Walter Scott Award and shortlisted for the Encore Award. The Mars House is her first science fiction novel published by... Oh, Golansk. I was going to ask you how to pronounce that. What's your publisher's name? It's Golansk. Golansk. All right. <laughs> Natasha has lived in Japan as a Daiwa scholar, as well as China and Peru. She was a 2016 Gladstone writer in residence, and she teaches on Bath Spa University's Creative Writing BA and MA, alongside short courses at the Cambridge Institute of Continuing Education. So welcome, Natasha. How are you doing today? Oh, thanks very much. I'm doing really, really well. Um, if the lighting seems weird in here, it's because I'm in the UK, so I'm about four hours ahead of you, and it is now night time here. Yes, you are, I think, are you still on Daylight Savings Time? We're on Greenwich Mean Time. Okay, which is not British Summertime. So you're still on the old time, and we're on the new time. Okay, so then four hours from the East Coast. Yeah, I love time zone differences with the daylight savings changes, don't you? <laughs> uh, it's my favorite thing. <laughs> right? Right. So, um, yes, and I'm on the West Coast, so I'm three hours earlier even than where a Mighty Blaze usually broadcasts from. But this is all good. This is just good for me because I'm an early bird. But the Mars House, let's talk about this beautiful novel. So, my first question is, when I read the um, quotes from the publisher for marketing this book, genre bending and gender bending come into play. And I love that there is that sort of mirror image of the two. I love the genre bending piece. Um, and where, since that's like a, a, a hard nugget to get around for people, and it's usually the first thing people will consider when they're looking to see whether a book is for them. Where would you place this in the bookstore? Could be a section, could be next to something, could be by the coffee. Where would you place this in its ideal place in a bookshop? Yeah, absolutely. Um, of course, in some ways it's science fiction, but I think the thing to remember is that a lot of science fiction is written by actual scientists and I'm definitely not an actual scientist. So, one of the things that I think anyone will notice within about two chapters of this book is that it's not really a serious forecast of what the future will look like. It's quite, it's, it's full of odd things. It's quite whimsical. It's a bit bananas in some cases. There are mammoths in it. So <laughs> it's not particularly scientific sci-fi. It's just another world. And in that, I would say it's almost more like fantasy. Mm. So... We froze for a bit. She'll come back in a second. Sorry. I wrote some of it while I was living in Shanghai. So there is there are parts of it that are very, very autobiographical um, and parts of it that, of course, are not, such as being stolen by a woolly mammoth in the middle of the night. That's less so. I wish it were not <laughs> less so than it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a piece... Um, there's a, a quote that I was going to mention that actually speaks to that. So you like to put Easter eggs, I hear, in your books. And um, I was wondering about 
self inserts because on page 97 there's a thing about i like clever people who could be derailed by tiny things and i thought hmm fellow i think i i sense a a, a fellow spirit here um being derailed by tiny things or ooh shiny things is that a little bit true is is hugely true um <laughs> And I usually really try not to write myself into books. Um, it, it's very much the kind of thing that I do. So they're a linguist. Um, I really love linguistics. I talk to my undergraduates with this. And you can definitely derail me with a weird question about German etymology. So it's just, yeah, it's me. <laughs> I think it's delightful. So that's a part of the other piece you've just mentioned, um, the they and the gender bending. So there's a lot of big sort of meaty themes in the book as as your other books try to tackle as well, class and gender and privilege and power and politics, which makes it like both very powerful to see what your vision looks like and imagination has conjured in terms of where we'll evolve into as well as like the playful humorous element that's mammoth academics and stuff like that. So um, where, let's see, historical fantasy, I was gonna say, is something that I feel like really has, has come into its own, or at least maybe I'm just noticing it in the past few years, like it's allowed to be its own thing rather than, you know, World War II historical novels versus science fiction written by scientists. I think we have this sort of melding and we're able to say a lot more about our own society because both of those genres allow it. So yeah. what did you think about stepping into sci-fi? Did it just enable you to use different tools or was there another impetus? Yes, and I, I realized when I started writing She'll come back, don't worry some of the things that I wanted to say were not really very possible in historical fiction because there's never been a time where we've had this kind of culture or we, we kind of move politics in this kind of way. Um, and what, one of the things that I wanted to do was have a very a, a very kind of genderless, gender-free society. Um, and this is partly because I teach at a liberal arts university in the UK. So this is this is actually just a reflection of my real life so where i work they them pronouns are just formal so if you don't know someone you're likely to call them they like my students call me they and i do the same for them it just seems polite now and that's been a shift in the last five years and when it first happened um i didn't really understand but i liked it i was really interested in how quickly you're able to make the switch and to get used to it. And also if you speak other languages that are not Indo-European languages, lots of places just don't really bother with kind of he and she. And this is this is the case in Mandarin. And I was in Shanghai for a And so I that's what I wanted to write about. All right, I don't know where I cut out there, by the way. I don't know that I did cut out. It might have been mid rant. <laughs> Something right after Shanghai, and then that's what you wanted to write about. Yeah. So um, when I was in Shanghai, I was learning Mandarin. So my life was happening in Mandarin. And they, they don't do he and she, which is kind of great. I really enjoyed mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, I forgot to mention we have a giveaway. So. Let me remind everyone, we're here with Natasha Pulley. We're talking about The Mars House, her latest novel, which comes out in six days. And the publisher's giving away a free copy. So if you want to be entered to win, get on the YouTubes and enter a question or a comment. Um, we'll get to some questions at the end of the interview, and we'll get to a giveaway as well. So stay tuned for that. Um, yes, the, the scholarly asides. You have footnotes. Was that a decision? Was that an argument with the the editor? How did that how did that go over? <laughs> um, 
British novels have a really good history of footnotes. Um, mm. so Terry Pratchett, fantasy, Neil Gaiman. Um, and I think more recently, the one that I read with great footnotes, not British at all, Rebecca Kwan, Babel, has footnotes. Yeah. Um, and I, I put the footnotes in after I read Babel because oh. I wanted to put them in and I wanted them to be sort of semi-academic with lots of interesting information in them. And I chickened out because I thought that it was a bad idea to seem pretentious and irritating. And then I read Babel and went, this is a book <laughs> irritating people. I am that person. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> Freedom. Freedom. You're really yeah. great. So, th thank you, Rebecca Kwong. <laughs> yes, yes. And I think, um, I'm trying to remember, hers are, are humorous as well. So if you're into that, like, dry wit and sort of wink and a nod kind of um, whimsy, the footnotes are a beautiful place to find that. So, you know, as you're reading, make sure to stop through and see Mick Wang. Yes. <laughs> you explain yes, some of your world building. <laughs> yeah, so I think I think my footnotes are maybe a little bit more like. Oh. I respected her so much for putting in academic footnotes in a novel. <laughs> yeah, excellent. That's it. I mean, that's a great role model and influence and like peek behind the scenes about the process and what you think, you know will end up as the, the product on the shelf. Um, let's see, what about ambiguity? So one of the things a lot of people expect in a in the future space kind of novel is some sort of twist. And you definitely have twists in your novels, the two of that I've read. So you've also got ambiguity. And I was just wondering like the relationship between the two. When your main ca character, January, is constantly wondering the situation that he gets himself into, whether he's seeing the, the correct side of this person that he's with or whether he's seeing a, a mask, you know, and that ambiguity, he's con constantly going back and forth saying, what's the truth? Then you're able to have this twist. Is it a symbiotic relationship or have you thought about that before or... I don't know, that just occurred to me when I was going through it. I think that's actually a great way of thinking about this. And I think it's something that maybe only an, a writer would say. Um, mm. I think that's really intriguing. So I think there definitely is that relationship. You can't generate convincing twists that feel feasible rather than artificial and sort of shoehorned in unless you build in plenty of ambiguity along the way, because otherwise there's no room for those twists to function. So I think you're completely right. Um, the big the the big piece of ambiguity in the Mars house is that January ends up in a in an arranged political marriage to a an arranged political marriage to River Gale. Gale. Or are we back? Back. Oh no, I don't know. I'm... <laughs> there we go. An arranged political marriage to Senator Gale. To Senator Gale, who is in some ways an absolutely terrible human being, and in other ways is incredibly kind. Um, so there's a lot of tension there. Like, what are their real motives? What do they really want? Have they murdered their last partner, for example? That's quite important in the story. Mm. Yes. Um, there's also the piece that is the other political opponent who Senator Gale is running against. And I thought you did a great job of having ambiguity around that. There's another, um, I think I put it in, the quote about telling someone, there we go, it's easy to tell if a person was noble or a monster, but here I am a month later and I have no idea. And I thought that is like part of the key is that your characters have the same feeling that your reader has. And I think you did that in a really successful way. So, Oh, thanks very much. I think it is a really important part 
of writing for the narrator to in some ways echo what the reader is thinking because otherwise there's this sense that the plot is happening by accident and you haven't mm. noticed that's a bit tricky um but on the ambiguity front i one of the things I think it's really important to do in a novel is not to write heroes and villains because that's a moral judgment. That's a good person versus a bad person. I think we should all be writing protagonists versus antagonists, which is just two equal people who disagree. Mm, yes, that's very clear. That's really good. What do you think about the, I feel everyone, especially on book talk and TikTok talking about books, uh, referencing morally gray characters. Do you think that's more of a superficial, that's not really what people are are gravitating towards? It's, it's not as complex as an actual morally gray character? Or do you think it's something different that you're representing when you have that protagonist antagonist? No, I, I think actually it's really accurate to call them morally mm. great characters. And right. I think you know, we hear these phrases again and again on, on book talk and things like that. And they they become repeated so much they lose their meaning. But yeah. I do think that it's it's a good reading. And I think morally great characters are really intriguing. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, am I back now? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And very intriguing is the last right. I heard. Um, so one one of my favorite characters in all of literature ever is Hannibal Lecter. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay. <laughs> I haven't he's seen or read. He's yeah, a great yeah. example of someone who is terrible, but also really interesting. Mm. Yeah, motivations. Yeah, yeah. Um Excellent. Let's see. Uh, more questions we've got are the playfulness side. So um, as someone who has read um, Neil Stevens, not Neil Stevenson, not Neil deGrasse Tyson, it's another Neil, and it's sci-fi, and it's a trilogy, a sci trilogy, um, with the AI who plays like a very interesting role in the society that he's describing. Um, it's graduated to another level again in your novel that there's an AI that's playful and it likes doing things and thinking about things um and the humor you bring to the relationships it's just so refreshing to have that side by side with like big picture thinking so does one come before the other or do they sort of naturally come out in drafting phase how do you think about those when you're writing so I had a bit of a writing revolution when I read Schindler's Ark by Thomas Keneally. Okay. Um, and it's it's an unusual one because, you know, I'm a genre fiction writer and I'm never going to write a book about the Holocaust. I would cry <laughs> and not do anything useful. But one of the things that he does in that book is he deals with horror. Oh, he deals with. You're going to have to help us out because I haven't read it, so I can't Sorry supply it. That. <laughs> yeah. So he's writing about horrifying events in this really nuanced but very lighthearted way. So Sorry about that. Um... P.S. Mr. Rorosuri helped me out here, though, that oh, Neil no. I was trying to think of was Neil Schusterman. Okay, <laughs> carry on. I'm really sorry about my signal. Um, so Schindler's Ark deals with terrible things in a, in a really clever way, and it's often very funny. And mm. I sort of sat back from that and went, I want to write about serious things in a funny way. So for me, that they come out at the same time. I actually find it really difficult to write something funny without also being serious and to write something oh. serious without also being funny. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. Interesting. Interesting. And what's, um, what's really cool, if you're a, a Mighty Blaze follower, you'll know that we just had Tommy Orange on Thoughtful Bro, and he was talking about how to represent trauma and horrifying things, but in a way that doesn't constrict the characters to only that experience and so there's you know fun things and like levity and um yeah that's so interesting that that's how it comes that's good um that made it very 
that, that made me laugh out loud. And so when I'm <laughs> traveling or listening to something or in a room by myself and the cat is the only one to hear it, it's still fun to laugh out loud in a book that's like that. It gets you so well that you're laughing out loud. Do you have a soft spot for mammoths? Or was it just an academic side that you thought would be a good inclusion? <laughs> Tell us a little bit about your... Experience. Yeah, I have a really big soft spot for mammoths. Um, oh. I'm, yeah, there's. I think they've been trying to resurrect mammoths for about 10 years now. And I'm just, honestly, I'm on the edge of my seat. I'm like, where's my mammoth? <laughs> oh my gosh. You're waiting for the Jurassic Park mammoth version to come out. <laughs> Where is it from? Like, I'm not here for the T-Rexes. Forget it. I want a fluffy elephant, okay? <laughs> is, I oh, let's see, are there mammoths in the UK? Is there, like, remains have been found in the UK? Or is it, because I know they've had different animals found there. I don't know. No, we'll never know. <laughs> I think um I think they normally dig them out of glaciers. Oh, we don't have okay. any here. Okay. We're a bit too far south. But I want I want a mammoth. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I was trying to think, I was hearing people talking about um other animals that um were throwbacks and I was trying to think, well, they were they were on the American continent, they weren't in Europe and that was somehow like key to the argument, but I can't remember. <laughs> Yes, mammoth. <laughs> An academic aside. I love it. Um, then what about? Ooh, okay. Here's a here's one that I was like really getting in my head about. So there's a quote where someone, um, so in this future world you've imagined, six or seven, seven generations away, everyone has internet in their brains like installed, which we're not far away from. And um, at some point it goes off and they're looking to the person who doesn't have internet in their heads. And they say, that's a sense of direction when they tell them where to go. Um, that's a myth. And yeah. I thought, wow, <laughs> it's a way of knowing that is so lost six generations later that it's become a myth. And this isn't groundbreaking, but I was just thinking, okay, there's definitely stuff like that about plants and living with animals and like reading the stars and signs of nature that like I would say, mm, skeptical, you know? Did yeah. you think of parallels with some of those um, sort of social things? I, I did. So um, there is an amazing Aboriginal language in Australia that requires speakers to always know where North is. Wow. deep um am i back i hope i'm back yeah um, you're back so you can't say um can you pass me that glass on your left because directions aren't relative you have to say can you pass me that glass in the northeast wow okay yeah so and they do this even at night um and they live in a relatively small territory that's relatively featureless so you know you can't use landmarks cardinal directions kind of make sense i don't know if they would do it in sydney but um, it's just how the language works and you're not talking right if you're using relative directions. You know, if we said on the left, they'd go, hee hee, she talks funny. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 So it was it was that. So there is there are still people who always know where North are. And that that really stuck with me. And I was thinking of that. Wow, that's really cool. I um, have a fellow writer friend and she's gotten really into um navigation via water and that sort of blew my mind thinking about when waterways were the highways and land was the unknown because it's completely reversed for us now so people would know where they were headed based on the kind of waves or the timing of the waves that were coming toward them and i'm just like how on earth and the question is how on ocean you know it's like our our yeah. land-based thinking is that is, <laughs> is that embedded Absolutely. Um, and I mean, like, yeah. and this, like, this is a very present thing in the UK because we're an island. So we've always been a nation of sailors. Um, but I mean, like, you are talking to a person, you know, a few hundred generations down from the, the time of the Vikings. 
and there is more English silver in Denmark now than there is in England. English silver, because? They nicked it. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Wow. So, okay. this, yeah, so where Britain is, it's just right on the edge of the seaways all around Europe. Um, and there's even evidence that right as far back as the Bronze Age, a tin was being mined in Cornwall and ending up in Syria to be turned into bronze weapon yeah. and arm. Yeah. So we've always been an island on the edge of a great sea map. And I think that, I, I think you're completely right, that navigation by water is, for us, still very, very present. We're not um landlocked and it's yeah it's fun when you can turn your mind inside out and be like <laughs> like it's a double rainbow moment almost yeah um how about some of the uh heavier themes you have some real direct commentary on immigration like the colony on mars has um striated I think that's not the right word but levels of society that are in equal and um part of that is the wedge of immigration and what it would do to that society and who would benefit and who would lose out um and the invisibility of the inequality so I think what's lovely is that you're pointing at not only that some people think this way and they're blind to a certain fact, but also how they got there. And then like one individual who is prepared to rethink it. And do you think we have those individuals now? Like what is the secret to seeing the invisible thing in a society where everyone is similarly blind? So um, the, the big thing in the Mars house is class. And this is what lots of people find, what lots of the characters in the book uh, find to be invisible. So working class characters just demonize upper class characters. Upper class characters are not aware that working class people struggle. Um, and I think, um, I think in the UK, we're super aware of class. We talk about it all the time in a way that I, I don't hear it spoken about so much in the US or it is spoken about, but it's not spoken about in terms of class. Um, it rather, it's rather like wealth levels so you either don't earn very much or you earn a lot whereas in the uk like class is more baked in than that um and my my feeling is that in order to see what the differences are and in order to re oh. sorry i was saying it's important to have experience of poverty, but it's also important to have experience of the other side as well. And to recognize that when somebody doesn't necessarily understand that poverty is hard, they're not being terrible. They just haven't seen it. Um, and I will, I will always remember meeting people at university. Um, I went to Oxford who just didn't understand the the background that I came from, which was like really deep rural poverty. And I will always remember one. one... Oh, <laughs> I want to hear this memory. <laughs> and we've got some good questions I can see being stored up. So put your questions in. We'll get to those in just a couple minutes. Am I back? Am I here? Yes. Yes. <laughs> what's, what's this always remember? That's where we left off. I always remember a boy in my class who came in one day, wrist to forehead. <laughs> I think maybe you didn't get that bit. <laughs> nope, wrist to forehead and it stopped. His favorite polo horse had died. Wow. I know. Yeah. I actually had a similar moment. My parents were just discussing a day. We just had a family gathering. They, my mom had been run into in a parking lot in the car. So like the car had gotten dented. She had to bring it to garage. A sinkhole had opened in front of the house. So like the city crew had to come and like patch it up because it couldn't get into the house. What? And like everyone was here and the dogs and the babies and the toddlers. So it was like a bit crazy. And she was talking to her friend and her friend had a garage door that wouldn't open and she was wrist to forehead. Exactly. 
Whoa. <laughs> That's much worse than the sinkhole. <laughs> Well, you know, different things. You got to be exposed to more. I think that's that's the, you know, end goal is like seeing and empathizing and eventually getting perspective, I think. Yeah. I'm going to say yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I love and I'll wait till she comes back there. Um, I love the piece. You've got a piece early on that is really diving into your main character's background um, and talking about how he has a sort of passport to different classes. He realized it was diff it was very important for him to be able to make friends in different groups. So he was never excluded from one because that's the kind of resource to have that access across the board. And I don't know, it, it felt very like escape plans like someone who's been insecure and then needs to know that they have a backup you know like kind of like depression era folks um having a full pantry you know like there's there's that sense of security i don't know i don't know if that, <laughs> that yeah. translates to british no de definitely and again that that's quite an autobiographical section um mm. so there's there's a part where January's father teases him for being a class tourist because he's mm. kind of moved away. He's become this, you know, this, not like me, an international ballet star. So he's, you know, he's hobnobbing with the rich and wealthy, but he comes home and fixes the washing machine sometimes. And his dad reacts badly to this. And mm. that's very much my experience of going home. Mm as well there's this sense that you well you were born there but you don't belong there anymore you've disqualified mm. yourself from this in some way um which is it, it is it is true and yet i was still born where i was born and january is still born where he's born so i i definitely do agree like that's an important part of it yeah that makes me think of like our concept of home and how that would change if we're colonizing other places you had an interesting piece at the very beginning that um, was one perspective on what we are Mars means, and then it sort of evolved throughout the book. And I thought that was really interesting. It, it Was it like, uh, how impactful are slogans in real life? Is it really up to personal interpretation? Or, you know, are there people who have a common understanding of something and that becomes a power in itself? Is that... Yes, I, I definitely think that slogans tend to start having a life of their own and they mean mm. different things to different people. And so they will they'll interact with them that way. In the book, We Are Mars is a nationalist slogan. And at the start, January takes it to mean no more immigration. We hate people from Earth. Mars should be for people who are born on Mars. By the end, um, he's been exposed to another way of thinking about it, which is Aubrey Gale's way of thinking about it, which is that what it means is that the conditions on Mars are terrible and you can't avoid them. So we are Mars means we are the people who cope with these conditions. We are the people who make these terrible choices because we have no other choice. Mm. Ah, that's so good. That's so good. All right. So um... <laughs> My mind is spinning on like seven different cylinders and wanting to go in different directions. So let me let me try and pull it back. Um, maybe we can switch over to questions. I know we got a few good audience questions and that'll probably spin us in more directions. Um, let's see. All right. So question from SD Houston. Did you use specific genre tropes like intentionally or try to bend some of these when you developed your story? So I, I think that's a wonderful question. Um, and I wish I could answer it in a sort of very meticulous academic way. But I think that, <laughs> I think that a lot of writers, me included, um, after, after you've written a couple of novels, you write in a very instinctive way. And you probably are, I am probably thinking about specific tropes and specific ways to subvert them. But I'm not conscious of doing it. It's very... You, I end up with this very synesthesiac way of seeing a novel, which is that it's kind of spherical shaped and sometimes it has lumps and bumps and I can see where the bumps need pushing outwards and I can see where I need to like hammer something flat to make it smooth. And what I'm trying to do in the end is make something that's novel shaped. Hmm. And what feels novel shaped is very much 
informed by you know all the other reading and everything else in the genre that I've read but I'm not it it's happening a long way down in my subconscious mm. so I could sometimes I can look at something and say oh yeah I was thinking of this I wanted to satirize it so I wrote this scene but mostly I can't that's interesting the only other person I've heard describe novels in terms of shapes is Diana Gabaldon and she says every novel has its own specific shape and it like mm -hmm. it sort of comes into focus as she's she's writing it which is which is interesting yeah we had a question from Mr. Rohr sorry about horror I wonder if we could pop that one up um you've done historical fantasy and now sci-fi have you thought about writing horror he said it would be really interesting and another comment so yeah what do you Ooh, think yeah actually, Hannibal Lecter yeah, Hannibal Lecter of course <laughs> Am I back? I hope I'm back. Yeah. yeah. I've written two short stories for collections of gothic fiction, which is like historical horror. Um, one of them is called The Haunting Season. One of them is called The Winter Spirits. The stories are called The Eel Singers and The Salt Miracles. They're both horror. Oh. So yeah, I have a real soft spot for the gothic, particularly like so 19th century woman in black kind of horror. I love it. <laughs> awesome. Um... We do love the 19th century around here. Uh, so we've got from Spit and Watches, what makes January different from your other protagonists? Very good question for someone who's read many of your books, it sounds like. Yes, I, re I recognize the username. <laughs> this is a great question. Um, and it makes me sound cleverer than I am because he is not different in any way from any of the <laughs> other protagonists. <laughs> All right. I, I am very aware that I write the same person and the same story over and over and over again. Yes. <laughs> um, it is always, always, always about somebody who is in a rut, whose status quo. sorry whose life gets crashed into by another character it seems catastrophic at first but really it all works out for the best the end uh-huh uh -huh. okay excellent i'm very excited like i was saying to natasha before the show to dive into the backlist i've only read the bedlam stacks and this book for the interview and so like i'm i'm getting the sense that i'm going to be like ladling at them out like pieces of reward as i go and you know being very stingy so i don't run out um, yeah, let's see JJ's. Welcome. Hope is such a strong underlying theme in many of your books. What do you feel is the most important thing to give a character in order for them to persist in their goals? So again, this is a really great question. And I think if you read writing manuals, they will always say to you, you know, your character needs to have goals, but often what they want and what they need are entirely different things. How do you deal with that? The character arc is about getting them toward their goals. Um, I'm really guilty of not thinking about it like that at all. Um, the character tends not to have too many in the way of goals, other than I hope I survive this. I hope I don't end up <laughs> hit over and the a head. And Mark and Jupiter or whatever. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, if, if nobody hits me over the head with a brick, I'm ace, <laughs> is what most of the characters think. I was just going to say, you don't have to hunt them down very far. They're on the website. So if um, Karen wants to pop up the website or, you know, highlight it, then you can get an easy link to where to find the gothic short stories. They're, they'll, they will be good. I, re I really hope Sorry. you like them, by the way. I'm really proud of those stories. They took me ages. <laughs> short stories are harder. Mark Twain said it's irrefutable. <laughs> they're harder. Like, they're, they're much more kind of um, intricate literary device like a novel you can just sprawl all over the place and be like I'm just gonna say what I want to say and however many words I want to bloody say it but short stories no your editor's like under 8,000 words please under 8,000 words and it's impossible yeah you got to be as refined as salt bay with your seasoning for a short story <laughs> <laughs> there we go so pop that up great thank you oh, perfect perfect um did we get the end of the uh oh, question? yeah so yeah characters 
the characters who I write tend not to have goals in mind apart from to survive. My goal for them is usually to get them towards something like a happy ending, even if it isn't the one that they would necessarily expect. So they are not equipping themselves with the things that they need for that. I'm usually steering it in in some way. Um, and it's it's very different for all of them, but I am always pushing towards that happy ending. I, I think Jane Austen was onto something. They should all get a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. I was gonna say forget Leo Tolstoy, but he's talking about families rather than endings. So I'll I'll just edit that. Exactly. Out. I, I uh, love that <laughs> <talk> about unhappy <laughs> families and that's really good. So, yeah. <laughs> all right, Shannon gets the last question. Uh, what was the hardest part to write in the Mars house? The hardest part to write was um, there are two chapters towards the end from the point of view of somebody who's actually a really awful person. And it's always really fun to write from that point of view because you, like, as a writer, your duty is to make sure that that person is sympathetic no matter what they've done. But it really tested my protagonist, not villain <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> and it was really wow. tricky. And when I handed it to my editor, I was like, is this too awful? Are they too awful? Um, but I'm pretty pleased with how it turned out. Yeah, yeah. That can be hard to judge like when you've been in something so deep to get to get a little like distance and be able to judge for yourself. So that's great. <laughs> you can pass it off to someone yeah. else and say, okay, reality check. I think this is the one. I think I did it, but yeah, yeah, help. Yeah, definitely. And sometimes people go, no, you're wrong. It's not the one. Do it again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Well, this is definitely a success. I, all the characters, they're ambiguously, eccentrically excellent. I loved having all the details of the characters and the really like living environment in this book. It was brilliant. It's coming out in six days on March 19th in the UK and the US. We checked. And so I wanted to ask you about bookshops. Um, you can definitely purchase it with all your other A Mighty Blaze authors books on bookshop.org. Or you can, if you're in the UK, what are your favorite bookstores, bookstores Natasha? Since I love a bookshop tour and a reason to do one. Sure. So in the UK, uh, you can get signed editions from Waterstones but you can also get them from an amazing indie bookshop called Goldsboro Books, and they specialize in special editions. So the Mars House doesn't have a special edition. There will be lots of signed ones, but if you want to check out their website, they have these beautiful copies with sprayed edges and amazing things of all kinds of books, and you'll definitely find some of your favorites there. So if you're based on this side of the Atlantic, please do check them out because they're very, very cool. Yeah. and. She's already informed me and I'm going to put this on my bookshop tour list for next time. So <laughs> it'll be an addition to the vlog that I'll put out from the bookshop tour I just did, which is amazing. Um, we're going to be wrapping up. And we're uh, two minutes out from our, our closing time. Um, I just wanted to let people know we've got this book that you should go out and purchase unless you are the giveaway winner. We've got an interview coming up uh, tomorrow on the same channel for another literary fiction book for A Mighty Blaze. Welcome to the Hyunam Dong Bookshop by Huang Morum and the translator Shanna Tan will also be joining us. It's set in a bookshop, so you definitely want to read this too. And yes, so subscribe to A Mighty Blaze. Check us out. We're the literary organization that keeps authors going when they can't anymore <laughs> and i think we're ready for the giveaway winner are you ready yay so this is our very high-tech stream yard random giveaway that makes it sure makes it clear to everyone that we're not playing favorites okay so that's <laughs> that's definitely proving that we're not playing favorites it's randomly i won a copy <laughs> I'm happy with my copy. It's got all my notes and my corners turned down to much people's horror. A mighty place. Okay. <laughs> Third time's a charm. Third time's a charm. You guys are good sports.
Mr. Roro Suri. All right. So um, thank you for being here. You have won a copy of the Mars House, which means you can send an email to a mighty blaze at gmail.com and we will send it on and get you your copy to a physical address. So congratulations and yay! A little bit of like happy sprinkling of fairy dust in your life. I, that's what <laughs> I always think these giveaways are. <laughs> Shannon says, I knew it would be Margaret. That's funny. Um, she's, she's telepathically controlling. No, she's not. It's random. <laughs> All right. So that is our interview today. Thank you for coming to A Mighty Blaze and joining us for our literary fiction interview with Natasha Pulley. Definitely recommend this book. It's on my five star recommendations on my channel. Um, and yes, Natasha, thank you so much for coming to uh, the channel and helping A Mighty Blaze put out more great books for people. Thank you very much for having me. And sorry about all the glitches. That's all right. We we go with whatever people bring. And um, I'm just so happy to have met you and have you here and um, such a great discussion. So I really appreciate it. And we'll see everyone again soon. Thanks for coming by and watching and happy reading, everybody.